Our scripture passage today is from the Gospel of Matthew. So chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. I'm going to read this passage and then uh, immediately following there will be a brief moment of quiet meditation. This is Matthew 16, 13 to 20. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, there's one type of story that never fails to impress me. Not only never fails to impress me, but really humble me. Just, just blow me away and just, just realize how little I've done in my life. Not really how done in my life, but how really, how little I've achieved in my life. And the kind of stories I'm talking about are stories of survival. Those stories that we hear from time to time of people who face just these incredible odds. And they overcome just the the, the most daunting obstacles and they somehow survive and come out on top. I hear about these stories and I read about them and I'm just, just totally amazed. And I wonder if I could ever do something like that. I never have. I don't have some kind of crazy survival story like that. And I often wonder and I'm afraid... Would I be able to make it through such a situation? I'm talking about a story like uh, Juliana Kopeck. She was uh, 19 years old. It was back in 1971, and she was riding with her parents. They were zoologists. They were going to do a study in the Amazon rainforest, and they were flying over the jungle when their plane was struck by lightning. And then the plane was struck by lightning, it fell into pieces, and it crashed down to the jungle floor. And and Julianne found herself on the ground, still strapped in her seat, but alive. She had broken her collarbone, and she had this awful wound in her leg. Everyone else on the plane was dead. She was by by herself somewhere in the middle of the jungle. The only thing she had to survive was her own wits and a bag of cookies that she was able to salvage from the plane. For 10 days, she wandered through the jungle. Through 10 days, she was there to combat a starvation, fatigue, hunger, and thirst. And and the wound in her leg even became infested with maggots. And the only thing she could do is she found an abandoned uh, logging station and got some gasoline to clean the wound out. But for 10 days, she wandered through the jungle till she finally found civilization again. Or it's like the story of Nick Schuler. He went with three other friends out fishing on a boat in the Gulf of Mexico. And the boat overturned. And these four men were left in the water wearing short sleeves and shorts. At night, the temperatures got down to the low 40s. And they're out there for two days and two nights. And Nick Schuler sat there on the top of the boat trying to survive as one after another, his friends succumbed to hypothermia. And they fell off the boat into the water and drowned. He was the only survivor of four people that had had turned over on that capsized boat that day. Two days, two nights in the water. And he was the only survivor. 
I hear stories like that and I have to ask myself, where does strength like that come from? Where do you find that kind of resolve deep in your own heart? And the scarier question is, do I have that strength? Do I have what it takes? Could I be one of those who was a survivor? Or would I be one of those many who just gets compiled in that list of, well, he didn't make it. Where does our strength come from? To see us through the difficulties, the trials, and the storms of life. You know, when all this... uh, COVID-19 stuff got started back in March when we were starting to shut things down and close the schools and the restaurants and everything else. I thought to myself, yeah, probably by May we'll be definitely done with this. You know, at the latest mid-June, we'll be back to normal and we'll just have gone about our lives. Well, I was, I, I was wrong. I, I was pretty wrong about that. I, I missed that by a long shot because here we are at the end of August We're still in some form of quarantine or another, and and we've actually made the situation worse. We've we've compounded it with nationwide protests, with riots in some cities. Some places have even uh, had to declare their own autonomous zones with protesters taking over parts of the cities. Our economy seems to be just teetering on the edge of a cliff. The whole nation is, is kind of on edge for this election coming up that gets nastier and nastier by the day. The future of America, of our lifestyle, of everything we know is suddenly thrown into dire uncertainty. And we have no idea when we're going to get our life back. It's times like this that call for strength. It's times like this where we need a dose of that strength. Maybe not to the same power and degree as surviving alone in a jungle or sitting atop a capsized boat waiting for rescue to arrive. But times like this certainly call for endurance. It's at times like this that we all need to have a little bit of rock inside of us. You know what I mean? We need to be able to to dig down and find some rock. And all of us need it. Everybody needs it. Any life, no matter if you're going through a tragedy or not, you need some rock because you're going to face a storm in life. And the older you get, the more you realize it's not just one year or this year. It's you can face storm after storm after storm. And you get a few lulls and calms in between. But there's always storms that are going to come up in life. And you need rock if you want to survive. And we don't want to just survive. We want to survive intact. We want to survive with our our personality intact, with our faith intact. We don't want to be ones that are just just blown away and given up in life. Because life is full of storms. And if you don't have some rock in you, then you get blown away. See, without rock, then we've got nothing but, but sand in us. Without rock, we're nothing but sand. And you've all built sand castles on the beach. You know what it's like. It doesn't matter how big you build the sand castles and you can dig a moat around it. The first wave that comes, there didn't have to be a big one. The first water that comes and the castle's just washed away. In two or three waves, it looks like it was never even there. That's what happens to sand. It just gets washed away. And if you've got nothing but sand in you, then, then you'll believe anything, you'll do anything, you'll follow any style or any trend. You'll just get blown away like the apostle says, like a leaf on the water, just tossed around by any wind of doctrine or style that pops up in our culture. Sand just gets washed away. Jesus told a story earlier in Matthew about, about two houses. One house is built on a rock and one is built on sand. And he says, the person, the wise man, builds his house on the rock because a storm can come and the wind can blow and the house still stands. And he talks about a, a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when he built his house on the sand, as soon as the storm came, well, you know what happens to sand? The house fell. And Jesus says, great was the fall of the house that was built on sand. 
We all need to have some rock inside of us. Some rock inside of us, some some part of us that is strong, a part that endures, a little bit of a part that doesn't give in, a part that doesn't compromise, that is immovable, something that you can rely on when, when you're lost in the jungle or you're floating at sea. Or something you can rely on just when, when your life is crumbling all around you. Some part of you that doesn't give in or doesn't budge. you got to have some rock. Now you don't want to be all rock. You don't want to be all just immovable, stubborn rock. Those are the kind of people that never change, that never adapt, that never accept anything new. But you got to have some. You've got to have a place deep down that you can reach into and rely on, a core, way in the depth of your being, something that you can rest your life on, your faith upon, something that will see you through the storms of life. You've got to have a rock because we never know when the storm will come and without the rock, we just get swept away. So where do, we, where do we find this rock? Where do you get this rock from? We've read today a, a great example of rock. And that, that was Peter. The Apostle Peter is a great example of how to have some rock in your life. Because this guy had a lot of rock. This guy had a lot of strength inside of him. In fact, he had so much rock, his name was Rocky. Rocky. That's true, his name was Rocky. I know we call him Peter, but Peter comes from the Greek word Petros. And Petros means rock or stone. So if Peter was English, his name would have been Rocky. In fact, if he was English, his name would have been Rocky Johnson. But he wasn't English, so we call him Peter. But it's Peter, but that name is Rock. And Peter was not his given name. He wasn't born with the name Rocky. Rocky was the name he got later. He was born with the name Simon. He was Simon Barjona. And it was actually Jesus that gave him the name Rock. And this story we read today is the day that Simon became known as the Rock. And he got this name when Jesus, he started out by asking his disciples a question. He wanted to know what people thought of him. He says, who are people saying that I am? What are people saying out there? What are they saying about me? Who do they say I actually am? And the disciples, they had, they had heard the talk around town. They knew what they were saying about Jesus. They said, some people say you're John the Baptist. There, yeah, there's some out there that think that you're Elijah that's returned. Some people say that, that you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. See, all the people, they, they were kind of digging back into their past, into their experience to try to figure out who this Jesus was. They were going to fit him in somehow into what had happened in the past. It was a way to understand him. But then after they said that, Jesus turned to his disciples and says, well, how about you? Who do you say that I am? And it was Peter who piped in with the right answer. Peter looked at Jesus and he says, you are the Christ the Son of the living God. And, and Christ is just a word that means anointed. Peter's saying, you are the anointed one. You are the chosen one. You are the one that was made to deliver us from all our sins and to save us. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus looked at Peter and he says, flesh and blood did not tell you this. That's his way of saying there's no way you could have figured out this on your own. There's no way you could have used logic or reason to know that I am the Christ. He says, this was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. Only God could have told you this, that I am the Christ. And then Jesus says, Simon, you are the rock. You are Peter now. You're rocky. I'm calling you rocky from now on. And on this rock, I will build my church. See, it's kind of a joke he was making. Peter means rock. He was saying, Rocky, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell are not going to prevail 
against you. And it was that confession that Peter said that gave him that name. And when I say confession, I'm not talking about like, uh, like we do a prayer confession where we confess our sins. What he meant by confession was you're, you're a statement of what you believe, confessing your faith. And that's what Peter did here. He confessed Jesus as Lord. He confessed Jesus as the Christ. And that made him the rock. By confessing Christ as Lord, he found the rock in him. See, it's our, it's our faith that gives us the rock. It's our faith that we find our strength. It's our faith that we can dig down and find that place in us that is strong and immovable and will see us through every storm in life. But it's not just any faith. It's faith in Jesus as the Christ, as the Son of the living God. See, there, there's a misconception going around today that, that the, the power of faith comes in just your, the power of your belief. And you can just believe in anything at all, and it will be your rock. T today, the big style is, is that you've got to believe in yourself. That's where you find your rock. Just believe in yourself. That's all you've got to do. Believe in yourself, and you find all the strength you need. And I know I've been on this soapbox before, but I'm going to get on it at least one more time. And I tell you, it's not going to be the last you can't find a rock by believing in yourself. You can't be your own rock. You can't be your own foundation. What are you standing on if you're trying to stand on belief in yourself? Have y'all ever heard the stories of uh, a guy named Baron von Munchausen? Anybody remember that? He was, a, he was an old like 18th century folk hero. And he told all these incredible stories like the time he rode on a cannonball or he went up to the moon, or he fought a 40-foot alligator. Well, there was one story in particular where he fell in quicksand. And he said he got out of quicksand by pulling himself up by his own hair. That's how he got out of quicksand. And we hear this and we know it's a ridiculous story. And physics tells us it's impossible because the pressure applied to pulling himself out becomes equal to the pressure applied to pushing himself down. Now, I don't know what all that means, but we know you can't pull yourself up by your own hair. The reason why you can't do it is because you can't stand anywhere to pull yourself up by your own hair. You've got no firm and solid ground. You've got no rock that you can lift yourself up by. That's why you can't be your own rock. Because to try to be your own rock, you've got nowhere to stand. To have a rock isn't just any belief. To have rock in you means you believe in Jesus as the Christ. As the anointed one. The one that was designed and made to be a savior to the world. And to be your savior. And it is this confession that made Peter the rock. And it's this confession where we find our rock too. Jesus, you are of the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when we find that rock, we find our strength. See, an amazing thing happens when Jesus becomes your rock. When you make Jesus your rock, his strength becomes your strength. When you make Jesus your rock, the strength of Jesus now becomes your strength. Any house you build, any house you build at all is only as strong as the foundation upon which it is built. And if you have a weak foundation, it doesn't matter how well you build the house. It doesn't matter if you build it out of bricks or stone or you use the best builders and the best materials. If it's a weak foundation first storm that comes will blow the house down. But if you have a strong foundation, if your house is built upon the rock, it can withstand storm after storm after storm. And whoever or whatever you trust in your life, whatever you have faith in, that is your foundation. 
Whatever you believe in, whatever you hope in, whatever you seek for your salvation, for your redemption, to bring meaning and purpose to your life, that is your foundation. And when you confess Jesus as Christ, Jesus as Lord, Jesus as Savior, He becomes your foundation. He becomes your rock. And His strength is your strength. I worked in hospice for 10 years as a chaplain. And in those 10 years, I encountered a lot of people who were going through some incredibly powerful storms in life. Because when you were on hospice, that was what a doctor told you, you've got six months or less to live. And that right there is a bad enough storm. But on top of this, almost every patient I saw had already been through going battling illness for years and years at a time, some awful illnesses. They had already been through a terrible storm, and then they're finally confronting this even more powerful storm of being told by a doctor that you got six months or less to live. And I can't tell you how many times I heard <clears throat> when I talked to these patients, people would say, you know, I hear God doesn't put any more in you than you can handle. And now, I mean, that gave a lot of people strength to hear that and to say that. And I never disagreed with them if they, if they really took a lot of confidence and hope in it. And if, and if it helps you out, I'm not going to disagree with you either. However, I will tell you this. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God will never put any more on you than you can handle. I'm not saying it's not a bad sentiment. It just doesn't say it in the Bible. It actually says something better in the Bible. In Scripture, it tells us the gates of hell will not prevail against you. And he's talking about the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And who's the church? You are. You're the church. I'm the church. Together and individually, we are the church. So when Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against you, he's saying the gates of hell will not prevail against you and against me and against us. So maybe God didn't say, I'll never put any more on you than you can handle. What he did say is the gates of hell will not prevail against you. The Calvinist theologian Theodore Beza once said, The church is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. The church is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. So the church is a rock. And there are many hammers that have come against this rock and have tried to destroy it. But every single one of those hammers now Lies broken. And we are that rock. We are that anvil, the believers in Jesus Christ. And we as believers in Christ have destroyed every hammer that has come against the church of God. The Roman Empire tried to destroy the church. And it's ruined. The collapse of civilization in the West tried to destroy the church. And it is gone now too. There's been persecution and invasion. There's been plague and war. There's been division. There's been skepticism. There's been doubt. Every single one of those hammers today has been worn out by the rock. And today lie destroyed and in dust at the feet of the church. So what about today? What about this disease, this turmoil, this uncertainty we all face today? This hammer will break too against the power of the rock. And one day even the hammer of death itself will, will shatter on the rock of Jesus Christ. But until that day comes, we face our storms until that day comes, we endure the hammer blows of the world. Until that day comes, we persevere. But we stand firm in the knowledge 
that we are the anvil of God. We are the rock, and the rock of Christ is in us. It is in you, it is in you, and it's in me. And there is no storm that will shake. There is no power that can destroy. The gates of hell, even, will not prevail against us. To God be all the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, will you pray with me? Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe. Father, we come to you together today and we declare, Lord Jesus, you are our rock. You alone are our foundation. You alone, Lord, are the sure purchase of our life. As our rock, Christ, we pray that you be our deliverer and our defender. And we come to you, Lord, and we lift up a lost and broken world. And as your people in this world, we pray, Lord, that you be our shield. Lord, that you protect us, that you would guard us, you would guard our families. Lord, that you would shield us from harm and evil. That you would protect us in our bodies, in our minds, and our spirits. Father, we pray that you would guide us, that you would be a shepherd to us, Lord, and that you would lead us through this wilderness to find our true home. We pray, Lord, that you would be our strength when we have no strength. That you would be our rock and our foundation when the storms of life come. Lord, we pray that you would be our rock to us in this time and that you would give us the strength to rise above, to endure, and to conquer. Father, we pray for those in our families and congregations, Lord, that that need you to be that rock for them in times of sickness. Father, we pray for Carl and Belinda. Pray for Kay and for Debbie and for Bill Hill and pray, Lord, that you grant them your healing strength. Father, we pray for those who, through their grief, Lord, need that sure, certain foundation and that rock in their life. Lift up the Reichert and Swigert families. Lift up the Ryerson and Dinkins families and pray, Lord, that you would grant them comfort and peace as only your spirit can give. Father, we pray that you be our light, our God, our strength and salvation. We pray, Lord, that any that are here today, any that have listened to this and have not yet made you the rock of their life, that do not yet know how their life can be founded upon the truth, we pray, Lord, that your spirit move in them and speak truth in their hearts. Father, we lift all these things up in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.